Well, good evening. Welcome to the Virginia Living Museum Naturally Speaking series. Uh, we are honored to be here this evening with you and so glad you joined us. We are sponsored generously this evening by Virginia Health Services, providing a continuum of care for all adult needs. My name is Rebecca Kleinhempel, and I'm honored to be the executive director for the Virginia Living Museum here tonight. We're gonna start with a few items of housekeeping. Uh, this presentation is being recorded for future viewing. Uh, we are going to use the question and answer box uh, for this evening. So if you are able to see at the bottom of your screen, Q&A, you can uh, enter a question and questions can be upvoted. So if there's a question there that uh, you were also going to ask or prefer, you can click and upvote that question to raise in the ranks of being answered. Uh, also, we'll only use the raise hand um, opportunity at the end of the presentation. So uh, I, again, like to thank you for being here. We are honored to be uh, in the presence and uh, in the virtual room with Dr. Rowan Lockwood. Uh, Dr. Lockwood is uh, with the College of William and Mary. So she's a neighbor right up the street from the Virginia Living Museum. She is the professor and chair of the geology department at William and Mary and a paleobiologist working in the new field of conservation paleobiology. She uses data uh, from fossils to help restore endangered ecosystems. Very cool. Uh, her research uh, interests range from conservation paleobiology of oysters here in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, effects of ancient global warming on marine ecosystems, and uh, the impact of the end Cretaceous mass extinction on the world's oceans. So uh, quite far ranging. She has traveled and her research has taken her around the globe from Kenya to the Great Barrier Reef, excavating dinosaurs uh, and even ancient humans. I'm enthralled. We, uh, we want to share that Dr. Lockwood received her BA in geology and biology uh, with honors from Yale University, master's in science in paleontology uh, at the University of Bristol, PhD in evolutionary biology from the University of Chicago. 19 years now at the College of William and Mary, Dr. Lockwood has taught over 3,700 undergraduate students and uh, was named by Princeton Review as one of the top 300 professors in the United States. So uh, Dr. Lockwood, conservation paleobiology, we're going to learn a lot from you this evening in uh, what we believe is a very interesting and engaged topic for Friends of the Virginia Living Museum. So we've got your introduction slide up and I'm gonna ask you to just dive right in for us. All right, thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, I wanna thank you for the invitation. Also thank the Virginia Living Museum and of course, thank you to Virginia Health Services for their support of the speaker series. So I'm very excited tonight to be here to talk to you about two of my favorite topics. And those are ice age extinctions and conservation paleobiology. But first I wanna talk to you a little bit about how we study extinction in the fossil uh, record. I also wanna give a quick shout out to uh, folks that are joining us from Tab High School, as well as CNU. We are delighted that you could join us here tonight. All right, so as a paleontologist, I've always argued that the best way to understand how extinction works is to study the fossil record. And this is really because over 99.9% .9 of species that have ever existed on this planet are already extinct. So if we wanna know how this works, we need to work with the fossil record. Um, we have over 600 million years of repeated extinction events that we can study. And that's what I'm showing you here on this graph. So you should be able to follow my little zoom um, arrow here. The x-axis represents time with 600 million years on the left. And today over here on the right, the y-axis represents extinction rates based on the fossil record. And you can see there are several peaks through time. And these peaks represent sort of natural repeated experiments in the history of life. All of these various different extinction events that we have recorded. You might notice that some of these peaks are labeled. These represent the big five mass extinction events. If you're looking for the one that killed off the dinosaurs, it's the end Cretaceous mass extinction event over here on the right. 
And all of these extinction events, they're driven by a variety of different causes from global warming to cooling, to volcanism, asteroid impacts, invasive species, introduced disease, um, and much, much more. And so as a paleontologist, I can study these events in the fossil record and I can learn a little bit more about how ecosystems respond to extinction. So one of the extinctions that we can study is called the Quaternary Extinction. And this is actually a pretty lengthy interval of time ranging from about 130,000 years ago. So every time you see me use that abbreviation KA in this talk, it represents thousands of years ago. And these extinctions, they really stretch all the way to today. And they're really dissimilar to a lot of other extinctions we have recorded in the fossil record, because at least initially, these extinctions are almost exclusively seen in large mammals. And I'm defining large mammals here as mammals over about 99 pounds. But if you look at this map here, this map gives you the distribution of extinction rates throughout the globe, these rates varied drastically from continent to continent with higher extinction rates shown here in the warmer colors in North America, South America, Europe, but also Australia and lower extinction rates shown here in the cooler colors like blue in Africa and Asia. And I'm gonna come back to this, why we have such difference in extinction rates across the globe in just a little bit. But first I wanna talk about these large mammals. What were some of the victims of this extinction? I'm gonna start with woolly mammoths. They're always a favorite. Uh, you could think of these as much larger elephants than what we have today in the way of Asian and African elephants. Um, but they were also somewhat furrier, somewhat fuzzier than elephants are today. We also saw Irish elk go extinct. These are very large elk that are famous for their incredibly enormous antlers, as well as glyptodons. And I think of glyptodons as giant fuzzy armadillos. They would have come up to about waist height on an adult human. All right, so much larger than modern armadillos. We also had saber-toothed cats that you can see in the lower right corner here. And it turns out there was more than one saber-toothed cat living here in North America, we think in to 12 different species. And that's in addition to American lions, cheetah, and leopards that we had up here in the US at the time. So other famous victims include a variety of different bears. Think of things like cave bears, but also this short-faced bear much larger than today's polar bear. And here you've got some adult humans for scale. We also have the mastodon, much smaller than the woolly mammoth, but ironically more woolly. We've got the woolly rhino over here and an array of other giant mammals, including giant beavers. My personal favorite is the giant ground sloth. So this giant ground sloth is about 10 times larger than your average tree sloth is today. And these giant ground sloths would have reached to over 14 feet tall when they were seeded, all right? So these are some of the, the major victims or the best known victims of this extinction. Now I wanna ask the question, how did this extinction of, of large mammals, and we refer to these large mammals generally as megafauna, how does the extinction of these large mammals, how does it affect the landscape? Now, the easiest way to show you how this works is to, to show you a reconstruction of that landscape. So what I've got here is a National Geographic mural of what Alaska looked like, uh, the steppe habitat in Alaska circa about 40,000 years ago. So you can think of this as the before shot. So this is, this, this is the shot before North America has experienced its quaternary extinctions. And you can see there's a whole slew of, of different mammal species that are represented on this landscape. Now what I wanna do is fast forward. So we're gonna fast forward to 8,000 years ago, and I wanna show you an aftershot of what this Alaskan landscape looked like after this extinction. All right, so in this image here, all of the white outlines that you see, these are all species of megafauna that went extinct in the quaternary here in North America. Look at this, it's almost two thirds of our large mammals that we've lost. You can see a lot of modern mammals that live in Alaska from bighorn sheep to mountain goats, a couple of different wolf species, grizzly bear. Uh, I think this is a lynx over here. Believe it or not, this is a moose hiding up in the corner over here, but it's nothing, nothing compared to the megafauna that we had back in the quaternary. 
And so one of the most common questions I get from the public is why? Um, why did we lose all of these large mammals? And unfortunately, the, the quickest and simplest answer to that is us. Humans did it. So the biggest driver of these extinctions in North America was humans. Um, when it comes to the causes of these quaternary extinctions, there are two main causes that have a tremendous amount of support for them. These are humans and global warming. I'm gonna go ahead and tackle humans first. Um, I should point out, first of all, that there are two other hypotheses that have been mentioned in recent years. One includes a comet impact and another includes disease as possible drivers of these extinctions. But unfortunately, there's been very little data to back up either of these hypotheses. And it's really too soon to tell um, whether they can be linked to this extinction at all. All right, so turning to humans, we have excellent evidence. You can see here down on the right-hand side that humans hunted some major large mammal species, including things like mastodons and mammoth. We have butcher sites. We have kill sites recorded in the archeological record. We have these large mammal bones being used um, for feeding and used for diet. Uh, we also see humans directly hunting some of the large predators during this time. And so this is considered um, direct effects of humans. Humans hunting or killing off these megafaunal species as a direct extinction. But humans had another effect. By hunting these mammoths and mastodons and some of these predators, they caused indirectly the extinction of other organisms in the food web. So the removal of things like mammoths and mastodons had a cascading effect down the food web. And that's what we think of as indirect effects on extinction or indirect extinctions, in this case called second order predation. Either way, humans are the ultimate driver of the extinction, just whether they were directly killing and hunting these animals or whether the extinction occurred more indirectly through the collapse of the food webs. Um, Given the data we have, we think that extinctions in both North and South America were primarily driven by human activity. It can turn now to climate change. Um, these extinctions happened at the end of about 18 different cycles of warming and cooling throughout the Quaternary. And we tend to refer to this as the ice age, but we should really use a plural form, the ice ages, because temperature increases and decreases several times. And these extinctions tend to occur at the end of the last glacial as temperatures were warming again. We call this the, late, the last glacial maximum. And so if you look at the fossil record, these extinctions in some areas tend to correspond with this global warming. If you're wondering about the magnitude of the global warming in the Quaternary, how it might compare to today, it turns out that the rates that we see in the Quaternary are much slower for global warming than the rates that we see today. One of the major concerns for geologists is that modern global warming rates are significantly faster than anything we've seen before in the geologic record. All right, so if you look at the fossil record for both Africa and Asia over here, we suspect that the extinctions in both of those continents were primarily driven by climate. I haven't forgotten about Europe and Australia, both Europe and Australia are thought to have extinctions driven by a combination of human and climate factors, right? So primarily humans and climate, but to differing degrees, depending on, on what part of the world you're talking about. Okay, so what can we learn from the quaternary extinctions? Well, I would argue that the new subdiscipline of conservation paleobiology gives us just the tools that we need to put the dead to work, or really to help us understand future extinction based on the information we have from past extinctions. And so I want you to think of conservation paleobiology as really a merging of both paleontology, but also conservation biology. And Conservation paleobiologists like myself, we use fossil data to help us predict which organisms, which ecosystems are um, most sensitive and most at risk of going extinct in the future. 
we look at all those repeated peaks I showed you on the graph earlier, all those natural extinctions through time, we look at the ones that are caused by different drivers. It could be global warming, it could be increases in CO2, ocean acidification, anoxia, all sorts of different drivers. And we can develop models of how both species, but also ecosystems are gonna respond to predictable changes, right? And this area has really taken off in the last two decades or so with a proliferation of different books that you can see here, research networks, grants, and a whole variety of different studies. Um, we use in conservation paleobiology a whole range of tools. It's a very interdisciplinary subject. And so um, we draw from both geology and biology in order, as well as anthropology, in order to tackle the questions that we ask. And we use tools like GIS mapping, that's geographic information systems mapping, as well as ancient DNA, um, as well as geochemistry and 3D modeling and digitization to help us ask these types of extinction questions. What I wanna do for the rest of my time today is walk you through three case studies that combine my interests in conservation paleobiology with ice age extinctions. And I'm gonna start with two um, from my colleagues and then the third is gonna be one of my own case studies. All right, so I'm gonna start off with Josh Miller's work. So Josh is a conservation paleobiologist at the University of Cincinnati. And for the last 10 years or so, he's been using the Arctic record of fossil caribou to try to predict how modern caribou are gonna to respond to global warming in the future. So he uses a combination of antlers, but then also skeletons that are distributed across the Arctic landscape. He does a lot of work specifically in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. So if you look down here at ANWR, that stands for Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And what he's basically doing is really trying to get a handle on how um, the calving grounds, where these organisms had their their um, infants, but then also their migration routes, how they were affected by warming throughout the rest of the quaternary. And if he can do that, he can predict where these calving grounds, but also where the migration is going to shift to in the future. What he's finding, at least for ANWR, is somewhat troubling. So he's finding that these migration routes are predicted to um, shift over to higher elevation terraces and areas in the wildlife refuge. And these are some of the areas that are actually um, a focus for both oil and gas drilling in the future. Um, and so he's been able to communicate this science and communicate this information to the managers who work at the refuge. They can um, basically explicitly apply it to the herds of caribou in the refuge. So this is the porcupine herd, which is the largest caribou herd in the refuge. And they're using it in order to cordon off areas of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge that will always be protected from drilling, from roads and from human development. So that's just one nice example of how the past is helping us to inform the future. I wanna shift now to an example of a predator and talk a little bit about um, Angela Perry's work on dire wolves. And so many of us are familiar with dire wolves from Game of Thrones. Are there any Game of Thrones fans out there? Um, I do wanna go ahead and burst your bubble a little bit and tell you that dire wolves in Game of Thrones, they're somewhat exaggerated. The real dire wolves weren't nearly as large as what we see on TV. And it turns out that they weren't actually wolves. So Angela Perry is a conservation paleobiologist at the University of Durham in the UK. And what she's been doing is trying to isolate ancient DNA from dire wolf carcasses. She's worked with five different carcasses from North America. They range from about 50,000 to about 13,000 years old. And she's very interested in why the dire wolves went extinct in the quaternary, but other wolf species like gray wolves and other canid species like coyotes didn't. She's used her ancient DNA, but she's also used the geochemistry of the teeth and the bones of these wolves to reconstruct their diet. And so one of the interesting findings of her study, which was just published literally three days ago, it's like hot off the presses here, she discovered 
that um, dire wolves had much more specialized diets in the quaternary than gray wolves or coyotes. Dire wolves were very specialized on those megafauna species, uh, like for example, the Irish elk that went extinct during the extinction. Whereas at the time, gray wolves and coyotes had a much broader diet. The other thing she discovered is that, again, dire wolves turn out to not be wolves at all. In fact, this is a lineage of the dog tree that split up about 7 million years ago. And based on her analysis, dire wolves wouldn't have been able to interbreed with other wolves and coyotes in North America. Now, this is actually pretty unusual because if you look at wolves and coyotes today, several of these species can interbreed. And Angela has hypothesized that the reason dire wolves went extinct and other wolves like gray wolves survived the quaternary event was because the dire wolves had that specialized diet and because they weren't able to interbreed. She argues that these results have direct implications for how we can serve wolves today. And it's not lost on me that the Virginia Living Museum, of course, works with red wolves, very endangered red wolves. Her study has implications because we've seen in modern wolf species today, including the red wolf, but also the gray wolf, that their diet niche is narrowing. As coyotes get um, a broader and broader diet, we're seeing other wolves narrowing their diet. Um, and so this is something that hasn't really been recognized much in the conservation literature, but Angela's work is really highlighting based on what she sees in the fossil record. All right. So this is the point where I reveal to you that I don't actually study Ice Age mammals. Um, I used to study dinosaurs, but now I really, I focus on shellfish. I'm very passionate about shellfish. So I'm gonna finish up with one of my own case studies and we're still gonna be in the quaternary. We're still in the ice ages, but we're dealing with ice age oysters rather than ice age mammals. I, I try to convince people that they are just as huge and just as exciting, but I'll be honest, it's a bit of a hard sell. So if you look at the Chesapeake Bay um, and you look at when biologists started collecting data on oysters in the Chesapeake Bay, it goes back to the 1940s and 1950s. This is about 50 years after we've effectively dredged and destroyed all of the oyster reefs in the Chesapeake Bay. So as a paleontologist, I would argue that biologists have never seen a healthy and natural oyster reef in the bay. By the time we started collecting data on them, they were already decimated. So it turns out that the only place you can really study a natural, healthy Chesapeake Bay oyster reef is in the fossil record. And that's really what I've spent the last 10 years doing. I wanna show you some photos on this slide to kind of highlight what I'm talking about. So this color photo in the middle, this is an example of one of these fossil oyster reefs that I study. It's on the Piankatank River. You can see I'm here for scale. This oyster reef goes on for about 12 meters and it's about a meter and a half high. All of the oysters in it are 250,000 years old and they're all preserved, articulated. The shells are still together and they're still in the positions that they were in when they died. Um, one of the interesting things about this reef is that we estimate it took approximately a thousand years for this reef to form. I wanna contrast that with this image that we have over here on the left. So on the left, this is a historic photo. It was taken in 1896 and it's a photo effectively, um, you can see humans for scale up here at the top but it's a photo of one seasons of oyster harvest in the first year of dredging in the Chesapeake Bay. So we've got a thousand years of oyster growth in the fossil record, a single season of dredging in the Chesapeake Bay circa the 1890s for scale. As I started studying the fossils in the quaternary record, I realized that the oysters back 250,000 years ago were much, much larger than today. So take a look in the lower left-hand side, you'll see a picture with me for scale of one of these oysters. Others speculated that these large sizes were because modern oysters simply didn't grow as fast and just weren't as healthy as fossil oysters, but it, that turns out not to be the case. I used geochemistry and SEM, um, scanning electron microscope work to show that these oysters grew actually more slowly than modern oysters do today, but they lived much, much longer. 
So the average lifespan of oysters in the Bay today is only four to five years, but the average lifespan of oysters in the fossil record in some cases can reach up to 30 years, right? So I've also been investigating the role of disease. So if you talk to oyster managers today, they're dealing really with over harvesting and disease. Those are the two strongest drivers of um, oyster problems in the Bay. Well, if you look in the fossil record, I've just started some work with a colleague in Copenhagen to look at ancient DNA in these oyster shells. We think we've been able to isolate DNA from one of the two diseases that oysters in the Bay face today. And that suggests that oysters were living fat, happy, and healthy with this disease over 100,000 years ago. So if you look more closely at the sizes of oysters, the abundance of oysters in the quaternary record, you realize that the pattern of tiny oysters and not very many oysters that we see today, it's really driven by over harvesting. We're simply over harvesting. And we're not just over harvesting, but we're harvesting the wrong oysters. So it turns out that we have um, a minimum size limit when we catch oysters, but we don't have a maximum. Anyone out there who fishes knows that often we have slot limits. We have minimum and maxima when we fish for different types of fish. Uh, we don't do that for oysters. We preferentially harvest the larger ones. And the problem with this for oysters is that larger oysters are preferentially female. So all oysters are born male and they transition to female after a year or two. And also the larger oysters get, the more offspring they have. So we are preferentially harvesting the females, but also the most reproductively active females. I would argue given the results that I see in the fossil record, that rather than focusing on releasing larva, rather than focusing on um, trying to breed our own disease resistance, oyster restoration really needs to focus on protecting the areas of the bay today that still have some large disease tolerant oysters. These are most common in areas where people haven't been able to harvest for decades. So think of things like the Elizabeth River, right? Um, in these areas, we have large oysters. We have oysters not as large as the oyster in the lower right, but we have some large disease tolerant oysters. If we could just build sanctuaries to protect these oysters, the hard work of bringing oysters back to in the bay would likely be done by the oysters themselves. All right, so in conclusion, I hope I've given you a nice taste of both conservation paleobiology, but also ice age extinctions. This is a new subdiscipline that uses the fossil record to help us predict what species and ecosystems are most likely to go extinct in the future. And we use a whole range of tools to be able to do this. We focus on particular extinction events that are caused by global warming, caused by human hunting, volcanism, et cetera, to help us make models of extinction predictability. And ice age extinctions, they are perfect for this sort of work. They provide direct links to modern conservation, including the caribous and the, the dire wolves that I talked about today, but also cave bears, ground sloths, and more. I wanna encourage all of you to come out to socially distance, mask up, and see the brand new Virginia Living Museum exhibit, which is going to, um, we think is gonna open on President's Weekend. It's called Exploration Ice Age Unearthing Extinctions. And in the meantime, I would encourage you all when you get up tomorrow morning, I want you to take a look outside in the daylight and picture the Virginia landscape as it was 40,000 years ago. There would be mammoths and mastodons, saber-toothed cats, giant ground sloths. And then I want you to picture what it would be like in 40,000 years time. I want you all to think about what you can do individually to conserve the biodiversity that we have today for generations, for thousands of years, and hopefully for millions of years to come. Thanks very much. Okay, Dr. Lockwood, that's a that's a big question and a big thought for all of us to ponder uh, overnight and into the future. Thank you, uh, terrific. And um, I've, I've got a number of questions, <laughs> but I'm gonna start with uh, one that was here uh, from Eric Hall. And he was asking what was in a photo on the left. And this question popped up when you were on the caribou conversation. Uh, I don't remember the doctor's name, um, but if by chance- Give me one can... second and I will pull it right back up again for you. That's fantastic. <laughs> All right.
And I think I see in the chat that Eric could go ahead if Rebecca, if you can unmute him. Um, are you asking what this left hand image is here? Okay, Eric, could you uh, raise your hand, please? That will allow us to unmute you. Perfect. It wouldn't be a Zoom meeting if we didn't have technological difficulties. <laughs> it's sort of how we all roll right now. <laughs> Absolutely is. <laughs> okay, come on, chat, come on. All right, if Eric, if you're still there, if you could go to the chat box and raise your hand with that icon, we would be able to unmute you uh, as a participant. Okay, are you there, Eric? Oh, it looks like he has raised his hand. All right. I do not have the opportunity, do not see the opportunity to unmute you on this computer. Oh my goodness, my apology. All right, while we work on that, let's go to another question. We'll keep working on it. Uh, from Stephen, what is the mechanism for extinction due to warming? Yep, so that's a, an absolutely wonderful question. So um, we see extinctions due to both uh, global cooling and global warming in the fossil record. For ecosystems like the Alaskan steppe, the most common driver is actually changes in the plant community. So the plant community dies off, then the herbivores go, then the carnivores go. And so we see uh, basically issues with organisms not having um, uh, enough sort of adaptability to deal with these changes in temperature, um, starting from sort of the producers, starting from the plants and uh, working your way up. In particular, large mammals are thought to have um, huge issues with warming. Um, so if you think about, um, how it might work. If you are living in Alaska and global warming is taking place, there's only so much further north you can go, right? Or so much higher elevation you can go in order to escape those warm temperatures. Uh, a lot of these large mammals don't actually have the surface area to volume ratio that allows them to stay cool, that allows their metabolism to, to really um, adapt and cope with these warming temperatures. It is part of what, for example, we're concerned about for things like polar bears today. So you, you've, you've got two things going on there, but it's primarily um, extinction through changes in the plant community. Uh, That's a great question, thanks. Okay, so um, meanwhile, Eric, going back to you, if you could, um, in the question box, perhaps put your uh, uh, picture question for us, that would be fantastic. Okay, also, while we're going here, uh, from Nancy, ancient humans typically only hunted enough to feed and clothe themselves. So you were talking about them over hunting. Why, why did they over hunt? What happened? Yeah, so it turns out that um, a lot of anthropologists do not agree with Nancy on this. So a lot of anthropologists do not believe that um, early humans only hunted enough to clothe and feed themselves. That was certainly true for some um, civilizations, but not true for many. So for example, if you think about buffalo hunts and buffalo hunts that used cliff falls or were driven by cliff falls, um, there was mass carnage associated with that hunting strategy with uh, many, many carcasses that went unused by the endemic peoples that were using that approach. So I would argue that, that you know, part of this is I think we're finding that for certain civilizations, for some resources for some prey species, humans weren't hunting them sustainably, even back in the, in the quaternary. But the other thing to realize is that indirect effect that I talked about, the second order predation. If you hunt the mammoths just in a, in a small area, we believe that mammoths had the same effect on a landscape that uh, species like African elephants have today. So African elephants clear trees, they clear vegetation, that changes the plant communities and a number of other mammals in that e ecosystem are reliant on those particular plant communities. And so what we're seeing, at least in the case of African elephants, is that when you lose, when you overhunt African elephants from an area, the habitat changes, and then other mammals go extinct 
because of the mammoth extinction. So for that question, Nancy. the diet of one species affecting the diets of other species. Sure, generally. the diet of humans affecting, yeah, yeah directly yeah. affecting the diets of <laughs> other so species. So on and so on. Yeah. Okay, great. Absolutely. Uh, from, okay, Eric says the far left photo, which on my screen appears to be the plains. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, um, that's the porcupine herd again. It's uh, particularly photogenic. And so what we have there is basically a, um, an image of that herd. Um, and I, I'm afraid I, I can ask Josh, I don't know which river that is, um, but it's the range that's out at the Arctic National Wildlife um, Refuge. And it's the modern caribou herd um, that uh, presumably the descendants of the, uh, the fossils that Josh works with in his ah, study. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Um, now let's go to Emery, who works with a lot of college students and young software engineers, many of them looking for ways to use their tech specialties to make a difference in the world instead of just building the next social media platform. So do you have advice for them? How do they use their skills and get involved in some of the tech like GIS, 3D modeling, et cetera, to focus on conservation? Absolutely, so um, what a fantastic question. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that broadly, but then I'm also going to narrow it down um, to sort of a, a local resource. So broadly speaking, conservation has never been more popular, better funded, and generally valued in the U.S. There are a number of universities that offer incredible conservation majors and programs, internships, and career opportunities. As part of those opportunities, a big part of that is learning skills like geographic information systems. You can get certificates through a whole variety of different institutions for GIS. Um, when it comes to things like 3D modeling, honestly, the best way to learn it is to find your nearest free makerspace and to spend several afternoons in there playing with the makerspace and learning how to use that software, learning how to use that, that technology. If you live in the Williamsburg area or maybe on the peninsula, you might be interested in a brand new resource that's being founded at um, William and Mary. It's called the Institute for Integrative Conservation. And this is gonna be a brand new major, um, first debuting in the next couple of years, but they are specifically looking for student interns and volunteers who wanna work on conservation, specifically conservation technology programs. Um, there's a lot of conservation work being done now that involves machine learning, involves neural networking, that's woo, above and beyond what my background is. Um, but we have a huge need um, for folks that are savvy with data science, savvy with coding, who would like to make a difference in the world. So if you're interested, I encourage you to Google the Institute for Integrative Conservation, or you can shoot me an email and I would be happy to link you to the IIC. Fantastic. All right, so uh, John here is going to extinction in North America. So if ancient humans hunted those large animals, uh, he says, it seems to me that the extinctions of some of the large North American mammals occurred before the population of humans was very large and prolific. What is that wrong? What do you, what do you think there? Yeah, great question. So one of, the, one of the issues ironically with the quaternary is that it's very hard to date the fossils. It's harder to date fossils that are quaternary in age than it is to date the fossils that I work with back at the time of the dinosaurs. And the reason for this is that carbon dating only goes back about 40,000 years. So we have to rely on other types of dating and they're not as accurate. And so in North America for years, it's been really difficult to kind of, to parse out the effects of climate change and the effects of human hunting. Um, this is particularly problematic because we have a lot of archeological sites, but it's really difficult to get firm dates on them. Um, anyone who's familiar with uh, archeology span in North America probably knows that there are debates over how and when humans came across the, the Bering Land Bridge, but also uh, whether they were able to access the, um, the continent through other means, through um, oceanic means. Uh, once they arrived here, there's even more debate on what routes they took to get over here to the, the East Coast. Um, if you look at the 18 cycles of warming and cooling before this most recent one, we see very few extinctions. And I think this is really, really interesting. We see just a handful of extinctions, maybe about the same extinction rate that what you see in Africa. But for whatever reason, at the end of the last glacial maximum, suddenly we have 
many more extinctions in North America. And the, really the only big difference for us in North America is the arrival of humans at the time. Um, many paleontologists argue that the reason Africa and Asia didn't experience strong extinctions, they experienced extinctions that were similar to extinctions that you see due to climate change at other intervals of time. But the reason they didn't experience human-driven extinction is that those organisms evolved in the same general, um, with the same evolutionary history and in the same ecosystems as humans. They weren't naive to humans and human hunting. But by the time ancient humans made their way all the way to North America, um, their culture had evolved, their weapons had evolved, and those mammals were completely naive. And so a lot of people argue that yes, there is some extinction of large mammals before humans arrived in North America, but the dating is difficult. And um, if you look, the climate change that we had in the last glacial, glacial maximum in North America is no bigger than what we've seen in the 18 previous cycles. So it's hard to explain why it would happen in the last glacial maximum, but not one of the 18 cycles before. Woof, okay, thank you. I, right, I've got another, another thought here from Jim, who's also gonna push you a little bit about ancient human populations uh, left our DNA within hours, their uh, DNA within our DNA. So, so do you have an opinion or prediction about human extinction? Um, so I think Jim <laughs> is referring to the fact that there is increasing evidence that Neanderthals interbred with ah. our ancestors, right? So you and I have, at least to a small extent, you and I have Neanderthal DNA. Um, so humans are a really, really interesting example. Uh, as a paleontologist, we deliberately avoid studying the human fossil record. We leave that to much smarter, much more experienced paleoanthropologists. But I will say, I will tell you what I tell my introductory geology class. Um, as a paleontologist who specializes in mass extinctions, um, I can basically tell you that uh, we're gonna go extinct. Probably not in you know, a thousand years, not in a hundred thousand years, but at least in a million years, humans will go extinct. We will most likely drive ourselves to extinction. Um, but looking at really long timescales in the fossil record, I firmly believe that the planet will be absolutely fine when that happens. I've seen our planet go through all sorts of different geological events and come out on the other side with a wonderfully diverse, wonderfully healthy habitat. Um, the issue is from my way of thinking, if we don't preserve wildlife today, we're going to accelerate our own extinction. If we don't preserve wildlife and its genetic diversity today, we're going to have trouble with our agricultural crops. If we don't start getting a handle on global warming, we're gonna have trouble feeding and clothing ourselves. And so I guess my own personal opinion as a, as a paleontologist, this, this horrifies my students, but I, I have no doubt that humans will go extinct in the next few million years. Um, I think the earth will be fine, but the whole point of conservation is preserving the earth, both for our enjoyment, but also for our use. So interesting then we're going again to diet because the diet of humans currently uh, uh, accelerates, right? All the CO2 with the sure. huge uh, uh, herds we need of livestock. Um, yeah, no, if you, look at, if you look at, at factory farming, um, and how we choose really in the last couple hundred years, how we've chosen to raise our livestock and chosen to farm, those decisions are contributing to global warming. They also are contributing to diversity loss. So think for example, about the conversion of pristine Amazonian rainforest into uh, short-term farming. So there are huge, huge issues happening now with human populations and how we choose to, to feed, but also how we clothe ourselves. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lockwood, um, thank you. I personally want to run up the street and uh, sign up at William and Mary because I should have done that a number of years ago and I am kicking myself now because I didn't. You're, you're fascinating. I uh, thank you for the conversation. Um, one more ch chat in here. Uh, of course, many thank yous coming in. Um, it seems that excess population can be a factor in extinction. 
humans have few limiting factors. <laughs> Again, you got to solve that one for us too. Yep. Yeah. These are one of those topics that uh, <laughs> in some ways I think are better tackled by anthropologists. Um, but I will give you my personal opinion, which is that um, I really think education and empowerment of women in communities around the world is one of the most effective and one of the most um, ethical ways that we can deal with the exploding human population. We've never seen on the planet, we've never seen a species grow and um, proliferate as fast as humans have with, the, with one exception. You'll never guess what the exception is. It's not cockroaches, one exception. That exception is photo photosynthetic bacteria. And these yeah. photosynthetic bacteria, they evolved about 2.3 million years ago, or sorry, billion, 2.3 billion years ago, an extra set of three zeros there. And when they evolved, they basically oxygenated our atmosphere. And when that happened, they killed off 99.9% .9 of other bacteria that were on the planet. Wow. It's the first example of life causing a mass extinction on the planet. And that is the closest, um, analogy that we have to humans. Uh, so from my, from my perspective, it really comes down to education and empowerment of women in their communities around the world. Amazing. I like that answer. All right, uh, Dr. Lockwood, thank you so much. Um, many thanks coming through here on, uh, on this Q and A uh, and we, we are thankful for your friendship and your knowledge and uh, educating us this evening. And for all of you out there, please join us for the next virtually, uh, uh, na naturally speaking series of the Virginia Living Museum uh, sponsored by Virginia Health Services. We'll be back with you on February 18. We welcome Dr. Elisita Carpenter. She's a wildlife biologist with the US Fish and Wildlife uh, Service here. And so thank you so much. Dr. Lockwood, you all have a good evening out there and enjoy uh, your thoughts that, that Dr. Lockwood left us with. Have a good Thank night. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye -bye.